each and every one of us that have placed faith in Jesus Christ, you have got the power of the Holy Ghost living on the inside of you. And when you are in over your head, when you are in deep waters, when the trials and troubles of life come your way, my friend, all you have to do now is activate the equipment that you've been given. And you'll be able to see it all from a different vantage point and a different perspective. Which is why I could not wait to get up here because I wanted to share with any of you, and that is all of us who are in trials in our life. By the way, every single one of you under the sound of my voice are in one of three places. You need to know that even if you are not in a trial right now, first of all, we would like to tell you we are happy for you. But every single one of us is in one of three places. You're either right smack dab in the middle of a trial on your way into one or on your way out of one. Because the nature of the world in which we live, Jesus said, John 16, in this world, you will have trouble. You don't have to go looking for it. Just keep living and the trouble will come and find you. But in the midst of that, we can believe in the truth that is told to us in two of my favorite verses in all of scripture. From Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that you can ask or even think according to the power that works within us to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever somebody ought to say amen to that that means there is no trouble that you are facing there is no difficulty that you're in. There is no pit you have dug for yourself. There is no situation or issue or drama that is currently unfolding in any of our lives that his power is not greater still. You may feel overwhelmed, but you need to know that your God does not. I love these two verses so much. They are a doxology. A doxology means basically an outpouring of praise and worship to God. This is one of the pinnacles of all of Paul's writing. And here's the thing, y'all. When he wrote the book of Ephesians, he was in prison. He was basically on Roman house arrest. He is in a situation he does not particularly care to be in. He is in a trial and right there in the midst of the trial, he has an outburst of praise and worship to God. Some of you stood to your feet and you said, I'm just like Paul, I'm in the middle of a trial. But in the middle of your trial, you did exactly what Paul did. Stand up and worship God. It's one thing to have a doxology while you're not in a trial. It's a whole nother thing. Captures God's attention in a whole nother way. When you are in a trial and yet you choose to have an outburst of praise and worship to our great, amazing God. That's what Paul did. I want to walk with you through these verses because if you can walk out of here and if I can walk out of here, seeing with our eyes open, seeing our, our trials and tribulations with a brand new perspective, it will literally change all of our lives. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that you can ask. And if you can't ask it because your brain can't even figure out the right words to verbalize what you're trying to ask, he says, that's all right, just think it and I can do past that. To him be the glory in the church, that's us, and in Christ Jesus both now and forever. The very first step in the progression through these two verses that are going to change our perspective, the way that we look at our trials, the very first step seems like the most significant but it really is the hinge on which the rest of it turns. And it is the word now. Paul says, I want you to start thinking about the greatness and the power and the amazing ability that God has toward you. That he wants you to experience in your regular everyday living as a single woman, as a wife, as a mother, as a person working in corporate America, as a person working in full-time ministry, as a volunteer, as a parent at the school, as a teacher, as an accountant as a lawyer he says I want you to start thinking about God's power and I don't want you to have thought about it yesterday we're not talking about yesterday he says I don't even want you to think about it in your tomorrows he says there is a time to consider how great God's power is toward you and that time is when he wants you to think about it right now now is the time for you to make a connection between what's happening in your life 
and how God wants to express his power to you in that specific situation. Y'all, this is important because if you're anything like me, sometimes there is a disconnect between my reality and my relationship with God. Sometimes I forget that the stuff I'm learning on Sunday is supposed to apply to Monday. Sometimes I forget that all the stuff I gathered, the encouragement that I, that I gleaned, that the word of God that was spoken over me, that the fear that was prayed out of me, that the salvation that I received when I came down at the altar, sometimes I forget that this is not supposed to be compartmentalized in some little corner of my life saved for a rainy day. That he wants to be involved on my Monday and then at work on my Tuesday and then at home on my Wednesday and then while I'm trying to figure out another way to cook chicken on my Thursday and then on my Friday and on, while I'm running errands on my Saturday that this is supposed to apply to my right now would you know that what happened to you yesterday means everything in your today that it's connected that God planned it or I allowed it that I fully intend to walk with you through it that the only reason why I allow circumstances in your life is because sometimes when we are flat on our back that's the only time we ever take a breath and look up and see him for who he really is. Because I'm going to tell you exactly what to do right now in the middle of your trial. I'm going to tell you, he says, to divert your attention, to turn it 180 degrees away from focusing on your trial to focusing on him. He says, you've got to turn your attention. You have got to discipline yourself instruct yourself not to concentrate on and nurse and uh, pay attention to the issue you got to pay attention to God he's the one that deserve your attention not the problem when we have drama that unfolds in your life if you're like me your tendency is to stay up a few extra minutes or a couple of hours at night going over the issue that you were facing or you walk through the bookstore and it seems like every single book you are passing on the shelf has to do with your drama and so you pull those books off and you take them up to the register to buy them so that you can read more about your drama and then you walk through the magazine stand and they're on the magazine stand every single feature that is on the cover has to do with your drama and then Dr. Oz is talking about it too and so is Dr. Phil and then you know Oprah's not on anymore but she's still got that network and she's talking about it too everywhere you look you are face to face with your issue so you give it inadvertently we don't mean to but we give it the attention that is supposed to be given to our God you know what worship is don't you worship is attention and some of us are worshiping our issue instead of worshiping God we are giving to the drama what's supposed to be reserved only for our God We're going to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter number 24, verse 18 through 32. And tonight we're going to talk about divine intervention. Divine intervention. Do you know that God will intervene in your life? He will intervene. Yeah, let's stand on our feet for the reading of the word. That's good. My brother was the first one up. You ready tonight. Glory to God. I'm with you. And I jumped into this at the 18th verse because... When I first wrote it down, I wrote down so many verses that it would have took the whole class to read it. So I decided to abbreviate it and dive in in the middle of the story and I'll put it in context later. And one of them whose name was Cleopas answered, said unto him, art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Pay close attention to that. Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? He's talking to Jesus. And Jesus, who sat on the Mount of Olives as the center of Jerusalem, has now become regarded as a stranger in Jerusalem. He has said, how often would I have gathered you as a hen does her chicks, but ye would not. And now he's in Jerusalem, but now he's a stranger in Jerusalem. What the Bible says, watch out how you entertain strangers, for thereby many have entertained angels unaware. 
Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which are come to pass on thee, on, have come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, what things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people. Now they talking to Jesus about Jesus, but they don't know that they're talking to Jesus because Jesus has become a stranger in Jerusalem. They're in the presence of Jesus, talking to Jesus, telling Jesus about Jesus, informing him thinking he is a stranger in Jerusalem. Isn't it funny that people who are talking about Jesus don't recognize Jesus when they come face to face with him? Uh -huh. Everybody talking about Jesus doesn't have the ability to discern the Jesus of their conversation. Because sometimes the Jesus that you talk about looks different than the Jesus that you walk with. Oh, do you hear what I'm saying? And how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. This is a collaborative effort between the chief priests who are Jews and the rulers who are Romans have conspired together to deliver Jesus to death. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. They're disappointed. We thought he was going to redeem us out from under the hand of the Roman Empire. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Nothing has happened. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O oh, fools, I love Jesus. <laughs> Especially this stuff right here. It makes me feel better about me because Jesus would let you have it. He didn't say, you know, I need to intellectualize you about this and bring you into a deeper understanding about the realities of the messianic reign of Jesus Christ. He said, you're a fool. Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, and beginning at Moses, and beginning at Moses, and beginning at Moses, and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village, whether they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Oh, have you ever met somebody that talked to you in such a way that you didn't want them to end the conversation? Abide with us, for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were open and they knew him. <laughs> And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Tonight we're talking about divine intervention. Father, as we go into this word tonight, we don't just study the word to be studying the word, but we study the word to better perceive your relevance in our contemporary life. We study the word to understand that we can converse about you and not recognize you. We study the word to more clearly be able to discern when we are in the presence of God. And we study the word to perceive divine intervention. Tonight, not only the people in the room, but the people who are watching me around the world, open ourselves up for divine intervention, to intervene in our lives in spite of our attitudes and our misunderstandings and cause us to walk into the fullness of what you have for us. Thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. 
Sometime at your leisure, go past the 18th verse and read the early verses that lead up in the 24th chapter unto the 18th verse because when you begin to read them, you will define that these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, one of them named Cleopas, it doesn't give us the other name, we begin to understand about these particular disciples that they are engaged in a conversation about Jesus that he overhears. And then comes and intervenes into their conversation. We want and we have a God of intervention. And I want to stress that point because some of us need God to intervene. What we are doing on our own is inadequate. We need intervention. Now, when I first started hearing about intervention and it became quite popular, it was what you did when you had a family member that was strung out on drugs or some other illicit behavior and the people who loved them would gather around the table and they would hold an intervention to intervene before they were destroyed. If that same spirit of intervention is true today, we need God to intervene in our lives, to intervene, to disrupt our life, to come in and break into the conversation, to come into our situation and our circumstance and intervene in our personality, our character, our behavior, our attitude, our disposition. Sometimes it takes God to intervene because we won't let nobody else intervene. Anybody else, you would fight them off. But God has a way of knowing how to intervene into your situation in such a way that you have to listen at him. How many people in here want God to intervene in your life? Now, the particular time that we're talking about, let me, before I deal with the text, let me put the text in context. This is a very unique particular time in history. It is after the resurrection and before the ascension. And it is right along with where we are right now. From Easter to next Sunday is the day of Pentecost. Next Sunday will be the day of Pentecost, which will be 50 days. But at the 40 day point, the Bible said that Jesus showed himself alive with many infallible proofs for 40 days. Somebody say 40 days. I want to talk about 40 days because 40 days and nights have a lot of significance in the Bible. It is not by happenstance that Jesus shows himself alive for 40 days. And I want to go a little bit deeper. He did not show himself alive to the Pharisees. He did not show himself alive to the Sadducees. Once Jesus rose from the dead, he had stopped showing himself alive to people who did not believe. There has to come a point in your life that you stop trying to persuade the unpersuadable. That you stop trying to convince those who refuse to be convinced. There has to come a point in your life that your time is so valuable and so limited that you don't have time to argue with people who want to debate you at the expense of people who await you. Oh, I'm doing good already. The Bible said that the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. That means there's some things that God shows his people that he doesn't show anybody else. That when you are really his child, no matter whether you're strongly his child or weakly his child or whether you're frustrated or whether you're confused, that God will show himself strong in your life in a unique way. There are believers in this room that have seen God show himself in your life in a unique way. Well, God bless you. It's a joy to come into your homes. And if you're ever in our area, please stop by and be a part of one of our services. I promise you, we'll make you feel right at home. I like to start with something funny and I heard about this single man. He was sitting on an airplane next to a beautiful single lady. They struck up a conversation and he asked her what kind of men she liked. She said, well, I like Native American men with their high cheekbones and golden tan skin. Plus, I like Jewish men. They're so brilliant and successful. And I like good old boys from the South with their long Southern draw. What's your name? 
He said, my name is Geronimo Bernstein, but my friends call me Bubba. <laughs> Say it like you mean it. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess, my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, God bless you. I want to talk to you today about protect your peace. We should get up each morning believing for a good day, expecting favor, knowing that God is directing our steps. At the same time, we should realize everything may not go perfect. Every person may not treat us right. Our plans may not stay on schedule. There may be some bumps in the road and things that we didn't see coming. If you're only going to enjoy the day if your plans work out, then you're setting yourself up for disappointment. In our cars, we have a spare tire. When I drive somewhere, I'm not expecting to have a flat. I'm not expecting to hit a pothole. I'm expecting to get to my destination as planned. But even though I'm expecting things to go my way, I've made provision in case it doesn't. I've taken steps ahead of time in case the tire goes flat. In the same way, even though you're expecting your plans to work out, even though you're expecting good breaks, you need to have your spare tire. You need to make provision in case things don't go your way. Well, how do you get your spare tire? At the start of the day, you need to make a decision that no matter what comes against you, you're not going to get upset. No matter what someone says, you're not going to be offended. No matter what delays, disappointments, bad breaks, you're not going to be sour. You've already made up your mind to stay in peace. That's making sure you have your spare tire. If someone is rude to you, your attitude is no big deal. I'm not going to sit on the side of the road and sulk. I'm going to put my spare tire on and keep moving forward. If you hit a pothole, something unexpected happens. Your loved one has an illness. Your child forgot his homework. The loan didn't go through. You could be upset, worried, but you have your spare tire. You decided ahead of time to stay in peace. And the people in your life, as good as they are, there are no perfect people. There is no perfect boss, no perfect friend, no perfect neighbor, no perfect spouse. Victoria says that I am, but I know she's either lying or saying it by faith. <laughs> Give people room to be human. Quit expecting them to perform perfectly all the time. Well, they hurt my feelings. If you have your spare tire, you forgive them and move on. Don't have unrealistic expectations. That person that loves you so much, no matter how good they are, at times, they're going to disappoint you. They're going to say things that they shouldn't. Don't be easily offended. Well, my spouse didn't tell me he loved me today. This neighbor doesn't invite me over like she used to. My coworkers didn't congratulate me on my big presentation. You don't know what's going on in their lives. Don't take it personally. Here's the key, your happiness is not someone else's responsibility. You are responsible for your own happiness. Too often, we're counting on other people to keep us cheered up, encouraged, feeling good about ourselves. That's putting too much pressure on the people in your lives. Let them off the hook. Nobody can keep you fixed except our Heavenly Father. Don't go to people for what only God can give. Are you going through life without a spare tire, only happy if things go your way? The problem is the roads are bumpy. There will be some potholes, unexpected challenges. Without a spare, you'll get stuck on the side of the road, bitter over a breakup, upset because a coworker left you out, stressed over the traffic. Life is too short to live offended, upset, discouraged. This day is a gift from God. We are not always going to be here. You have to put your foot down and say, I am not going to let these same things keep upsetting me. I am going to stay in peace even if the boss is unfair, even if my spouse is grumpy, even if my flight is delayed, even if the medical report isn't good. This is the day the Lord has made. I have made up my mind. I'm going to enjoy it.
When we go around offended, upset, discouraged, really it dishonors God. He's entrusted us with life. He could have chosen anyone to be here, but before time began, in his great mercy, he handpicked you. He not only chose you, but he created you in his own image. He's planned out your days. He's crowned you with favor. Now he's directing your steps. The way to honor God is to get up each day with passion, being your best, pursuing what he put in your heart. What if all of us took that attitude after we face a rejection and a no or we have a meeting and no one shows up or somebody say, you can count on me and they don't come through. What if we have that kind of attitude, the cause repossessed, nobody believes in you, you've lost again and again and again, the lights are cut off, but you're still looking at your dream, reviewing it every day and say to yourself, it's not over until I win. I do not believe that any of us have dreams that were not given to us for the purpose of accomplishing those particular dreams. And I want to share something with you that has changed my life. I started out as was indicated by Jack. It's a very humble beginnings. I don't know what that dream is that you have. I don't care how far-fetched it might appear to be. I don't care how disappointing it might have been as you've been working toward that dream. But here's what I know, that that dream that you're holding in your mind, that it's possible. Let's say that together, please. It's possible. See, sometimes we can't say, I can do that. But what we can say, that it's possible that I can have my dream as we run toward it, as we work on it day in and day out. No one, ladies and gentlemen, could have convinced me when I started out just over six years ago working on my dream. And I want you to think about whatever your dream is because I was willing to take a chance and most people won't do that most of the people that you talk to to try and bring them into the business these are not risk takers most people have done all that they're ever going to do they raise a family they earn a living and then they die but people who are running toward their dreams life has a special kind of meaning and here's what I will share with you that in the process of working on your dreams, you are going to incur, incur a lot of disappointment, a lot of failure, a lot of pain, a lot of setbacks, a lot of defeats. But in the process of doing that, you will discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. What you will realize is that you have greatness within you. What you'll realize is that you're more powerful than you can ever begin to imagine. What you will realize is that you are greater than your circumstances, that you don't have to go through life being a victim. I was born in Miami, Florida, in an area called Liberty City, in an abandoned building on a hard Nanolian floor with my twin brother. We were six weeks of age, we were adopted. When I was in fifth grade, I was identified as EMR, labeled, educable, mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade into the fourth grade, and stayed in that category until I got out of high school. I don't have any college training, but I met a high school teacher who one day changed my life. I was waiting on another student, and when he came in, he said to me, young man, go to the board and write what I'm about to tell you. And I said, I, I can't do that, sir. And he said, why not? I said, I'm not one of your students. He said, it doesn't matter, follow my directions now. I said, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, because I'm educable, mentally retarded. And he came from behind his desk and he looked at me. He said, don't ever say that again. 
someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And ladies and gentlemen, I started working on my dream, and most people don't work on their dreams. Why? For many years, I didn't. One is because of fear, the fear of failure. What if things don't work out? And the fear of success, what if they do and I can't handle it? The other thing is that most people, ladies and gentlemen, they get comfortable. They stop growing, they stop working on themselves, they stop stretching, they stop pushing themselves, and they end up becoming very cynical about life, and they throw in the towel on themselves, and on their families, and on their dreams. And the other thing is that most people don't feel worthy. What I'm doing now, I could have been doing years ago. But because I did not have a college education, because I didn't believe in myself, because I allowed other people's opinion of me to control my destiny, I didn't act on my ideas. But not only is it important that you believe and begin to know that it's possible for you to live your dream as you run toward it, and not only is it important for you to know it's possible for you to choose your future, but it's necessary that you work on yourself, that you develop yourself. It's necessary that you get the energy drainers out of your life, people who don't want anything, people who are not striving, people who are not challenging themselves, people who aren't growing, people who have stopped dreaming. It's necessary. Go to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter number 13, verse 24 through 30, and there you will find my assignment for this morning. I will be reading it out of the NIV. Uh, when you have it, say amen. If you're still looking, say wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Matthew, the Gospel of St. Matthew, the first book in the New Testament. Jesus told them another parable. What was it? It was a Yeah, it was a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed. What did he do? <laughs> He sowed good seed in his field. Now, first miracle, you got to recognize, the choir didn't know what I was going to preach. When they prepared for worship, they didn't know what I was going to preach. But for weeks I have been seeing roots. Something is about to come out of the ground. Jesus told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When did he do it? While they were sleeping. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, when the, when, when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us, do you want us, watch this closely, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together. <laughs> Oh my God, let growth grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters first, 
collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Can you say amen? Shout this with me. Timing is everything. Shout it again. Timing is everything. Shout it again. Timing is everything. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on the word of God as we go into it today. Let it bring life and healing and renewal and restoration as we delve into the depths of God's word. Bring out treasures and ministry and healing and revelation. I thank you for what you are about to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody shout amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Yeah, let's go to work. Over the 65 years of my life, I don't think I knew it when I started. I started preaching at 19. I started pastoring at 21. I don't think I knew it then, but I know it now. The best things in life takes time. <laughs> When I was younger, I was impatient because I had the naivety of thinking that dreams would come quickly. But the best things in life take time. From simple things like food, preparation to more complicated issues of parenting and marriage, the best things in life take time. People who don't have time to cook don't cook well because the best things in life take time. You can get married, you can have a wedding in 30 minutes, but it takes years to have a marriage. The best things in life take what? It is a sharp contrast between being rich and being wealthy. You can hit the lottery, receive an inheritance. Uh, you can be catapulted from rags to riches and you can be rich quick. Though many define wealth differently than how I will today, true wealth isn't just about money, but it is about the lessons you learn while struggling upward. If you have money without wisdom, you will soon be parted from your money. The best things in life take time takes relationships. You've got the money, but because it was given to you quickly, you didn't build the infrastructure to sustain it. You don't have the relationships to sustain it. You don't have the information to sustain it. And most people who hit the lottery, 70 to 80% of them go broke within five years. You can't imagine that you could hit that much money and lose it, but the truth of the matter is, God is teaching us that the best things in life take time. This room is full of people tonight and lots of people watching by TV that you're trusting God for something. You're asking God to change something in your life, to give you something or to make something go away that's unpleasant. You're trusting God to change somebody else in your life. It's one thing to trust God to give you something or to do something. It's another thing entirely to trust God through something are to continue trusting God when he's not giving you what you want, when everything around you is shaking and you just do not understand what is going on. I would imagine that we have people here tonight and lots of them that you feel like literally everything in your life is shaking right now. Got anybody? All right. Now see, for some of you, it's just a thing here or there, but some of you, I mean, it's like, what is going on? And you just don't understand. But I can tell you from many years of experience, and the only way you really learn how to trust God is through experience, by the way. We all start out wanting to trust God, and the only way we learn how to trust God is by having a reason to have to trust God. <laughs> and then as we do trust Him, we see His faithfulness, and then little by little, as we journey with God, 
and our walk with him is a journey. As we journey with God, we gain experience. Now, the way you trust God now, if you've been born again for five years, is nothing compared to the way you'll trust God another five years go by, or another 10 years go by, or another 20 years go by. And we will never 100% completely trust until Jesus comes back to get us. But thankfully, we can continue to grow. Trust in God is a decision. And I want to encourage those of you tonight that feel like everything in your life is shaking, that your only real answer is to trust God and to keep on trusting God and to keep on trusting God. And yes, it's difficult when you don't understand what's going on, and it's especially difficult when what's going on in your life just does not seem fair. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26, which is where we're going to begin, talks about how God shakes things in our life until only those things that cannot be shaken remain. So that means God's going to work with us until we let go of all the unstable things in our life and we're only hanging on to the rock of our salvation that cannot be moved. Let me give you an example. I like examples Jesus taught in parables and I just think we need practical examples. Many years ago when my ministry was in the very beginning stages, I had a group of, I thought, friends. Have you ever had any people that you thought were friends and then found out they weren't? Do you know people like that are dangerous to you? When you put your confidence in people that really are not who you think they are, it's a constant open door for the devil to work through them to get to you. And so many times in God's mercy, he will remove those people from our lives and initially we may not understand. It's very difficult when something is stripped out of your life that you're not ready to give up yet. Amen. And so I had these, this group of women, they helped me in my women's ministry, there was about 12 of them. And I just thought they were my best friends ever. They would never hurt me. They'll always be for me. Well, that's the first mistake. There is nobody on this earth that's breathing that will never hurt you. <laughs> I don't care how much they love you, as human beings, we do not have the ability to never, ever, ever hurt somebody or disappoint somebody that we're in relationship with. So you're setting yourself up for a lot of pain if you're looking at anybody thinking, you'll never hurt me. I can always, always depend on you. Don't give that trust to anybody but Jesus. He is the only one that deserves that kind of total, complete, radical trust. And don't ever look at anybody and think, I don't know what I'd do without you. I don't know what I'd do without you. The only one you want to say that to is Jesus. I don't know what I would do without you. And so, long story short, I had a relationship with these ladies for a long time, and we were just having fun. Just having fun, being in, I think, really playing at being in ministry at that point. And um, I still couldn't even really tell you what happened. I know now that it was God just revealing their weaknesses. Not that I didn't have a bunch of my own, I did, but God was going to promote me to new levels in ministry. He had a plan for my life, and I couldn't take those people with me. Do you know, every place where the bus stops, somebody has to get off. Amen. <laughs> and so the bus was stopped and God was ready to take me to my next destination, but there were some people that needed to get off the bus and I didn't know it. So long story short, I found out they were talking about me behind my back. I found out that one of them was after my job. 
I found out that they were telling lies about me. And look at me when I tell you that I was devastated and heartbroken. I couldn't believe it because they were Christians. <laughs> now, I had come from worldly relationships where people did that kind of stuff, but these were Christians. So don't even look at your Christian friends and think, you will never hurt me. And it's not even that people are mean, they're just people. They're just fleshly people. And so that's a time when I can remember when man was my world shaken. I mean shaken. I did not understand what was going on. The pain in my soul was so deep. But part of the thing that you have to realize is that what you don't understand now, things that you're going through right now that you do not understand, you cannot make any sense out of at all, later on, I promise you, later on, you will look back and say, now I get it. Now I get it. Amen? And please believe me when I say that a lot of the things that you think are terrible actually in reality are good. I love to talk about David. I'm going to try not to get lost in talking about David because I could spend all night talking about David. He's probably one of my favorite characters in the Bible. But I'm just using David's life as a metaphor to really talk to you because my assignment tonight is to bring you into a place where you can have still waters and you cannot have still waters until you release or let go many of the things that are distracting you and invading your space. But let me preface my remarks by saying that David is not the preferred son of Jesse. In fact, he is an ignored son of Jesse. He is the eighth child of Jesse, his father. He does not look like his life is going anywhere. He is a shepherd boy with a destiny locked inside of him. But at this moment in his life, at the early stages in his life, he is surrounded by mediocrity. Now, mediocrity is not a bad thing. Ordinariness is not a bad thing until you have greatness inside of you. When you have greatness inside of you and you're surrounded by mediocrity, you can be tormented by what other people are satisfied with. Tormented and taunted by the fact that there is a sense, there is an inner knowing within all of us that we are people of purpose and that something is supposed to happen in our lives. The challenge is how do we get that thing that we sense in our spirit to manifest in our life when we are constantly bombarded with adversity? David is not the preferred son of Jesse. Seemingly when the enemy knows that God is going to use you in a mighty way, he does everything he can to upset the very genesis of your life, to kind of set you on a path of destructive behavior, to limit any self-esteem that you might have. He doesn't do that. He doesn't fight anybody that's not destined to go anywhere. But when he senses that there is greatness inside of you, the attack comes early it comes early somebody knows what I'm talking about somebody who's had to fight all of your life had to struggle all of your life you feel like Oprah on the color purple I had to fight all of my life you've been through all kinds of stuff and that is not a sign of weakness it is a sign of greatness and David has greatness down inside of himself but he has to go through a process for that greatness to be revealed and over a period of time God begins to bring forth his purpose I've been on a tangent in my church about living on purpose I've been teaching for weeks and weeks and weeks about living on purpose because most people get up out of the bed in the morning to see what's going to happen. And then there are an elect group of people who get up out of the bed to make something happen. 
you have to decide which category you're going to be in either you're going to get up on, on the bed and sit on the side of the bed and say well lord what am i going to do today or you're going to wake up with an agenda and an urgency and a direction and a focus see when you got direction you resist distraction I said, when you got direction, you resist distraction. You know what is and is not on your agenda. David had to find that place where he began to understand that God was going to do something in his life for which his background did not predict. You would not think that God would make a king out of a shepherd boy. I want to take a moment and say, do not limit your vision to your situation. Your situation may not be an indicator of what God is going to do in your life. In fact, your situation and circumstance can be a direct contradiction to what God is going to do in your life. I have learned that God has a tendency to use the least likely people to do the most amazing things so that when they do them, there is no question as to how they got to do what they did. It is absolutely a fact that if the Lord had not been on your side you wouldn't be able to do what you do anybody who'd been through what you've been through should have had a nervous breakdown should have thrown in the towel should have blown their brains out anybody who had to fight the way you had to fight all of your life I'd not even be here tonight but when God is for you I said when God is for you who can be against you it doesn't matter whether you're the preferred son or you were the preferred daughter or whether you came from the Ivy League school or not when God is for you he will push you ahead he will set you in a position he will raise you up and he will do it in such a way that when it happens this is why you have haters because when it happens they can't understand how somebody like you could end up in a place like the problem with your haters is that they think that they're more qualified and they may be they think they've been groomed for it and they may have but when you walk in divine favor God can execute a plan in your life that supernaturally imposes you into a position for which you've never been there before and you're walking around like Gomer Powell talking about golly you don't even know how you got there but God can beam you up and I don't know who I'm preaching to but somebody you're getting ready to be beamed into a position and a situation that is beyond human comprehension this is why you cannot afford to allow the turbulence of the times <laughs> the wickedness of your surroundings the narrowness of your friends to deter you from your destiny you have to have a sense in your spirit and in your heart that you have a direction and a purpose and you're going to live on that purpose in spite of your predicament now God reveals himself and God God is something to reveal himself he is beyond human comprehension if you can explain it, it's not God. God is a mystery. He is a mystery that whenever he gets ready to communicate with you, he has to reduce himself down into a form that you can understand. Because if he were to come to you in the fullness of who he is, it would cause your brain to pop. Your mind couldn't comprehend what Paul calls the manifold wisdom of God. He has, there's so much to him and so he has to break it down to you real slow so when you're hungry he has to say I'm bread and when you're thirsty he has to say I'm water and when you're sick he has to say I'm a physician and when you're lonely he has to say I'm a friend and oh y'all don't hear what I'm saying and, but see he's really all of that at the same time but he has to bring it on you real slow David has no background to be king he has no background to be king He's not come from the upper echelon of Israel. He come from common people. 
His father was a common man. He was a shepherd boy. Smelled of sheep dung. Gnats and flies around him. He stank. He was a little bit weird. When God found him, he was dancing on the mountainside, writing poems to God. Just, just a little off-center. Yeah, peculiar, strange. One of our great problems today is that we resist being peculiar. We, we seek to fit in rather than to stand out. I was 17 years old, I laid down and went to sleep. And while I was sleeping, I dreamed. I was reading a verse that I didn't know existed at the time. God was saying to a young man, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, or I ordained thee and I sanctified thee to be a prophet to the nations. And when I woke that morning, I just took my Bible with, with childlike faith and just let it fall open and it fell open on Jeremiah and he said before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee and I ordained thee and I sanctified thee to be a prophet unto the nations and all of a sudden I remembered all the stories my mother told me about when I was born I was born with a veil over my face and then one of the neighbors came down and said look the Lord has given you a prophet and mama said, a prophet? She said, yeah, he has a veil over his face. Thin membrane, born over some baby's faces. I was one of them. That membrane, the old folks said, was a sign you were a prophet. But I didn't know I was a prophet, so I was a wild, crazy, foolish, ignorant, rambunctious kid who got into everything and anything all the time, driving people crazy. And I was having a good time doing my own thing until God came along and messed it all up by bringing this stuff again about me being a preacher. And I, I ran from my calling. I purposely got drunk and went wild and got high and partied and did everything I could to convince him to go away. Get one of them people with the little doilies on their head and the long skirts on and the no makeup who pray all day and talk in tongues all the time and leave me alone because I am not one of them. I'm crazy. I'm ignorant. I'm wild. I'm uncouth. I will embarrass you. I will disgrace you. Please don't call me. This is not going to be good for you and it's not going to be good for me and we should not do this together. <laughs> but God didn't ask me to vote. He asked me to obey. And after several years of running, I, and after several years of going in clubs and sitting on bar stools where one drunk would lean over to me and say, funny man, I had the craziest dream about you. I, I dreamed you were preaching in this church and, uh, and I got up and ran out of the club. <laughs> And I felt like David, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. And if I take the wings of the morning and ascend to the uttermost parts of the earth, thou art there. And I'm not going to be able to outrun this. And I couldn't understand that God wouldn't let me go. I couldn't understand why God picked me. If I get to heaven and we're only allowed one question apiece, I simply want to know, why did you call me? A boy from the hills of West Virginia the son of a janitor and a school teacher. Why did you call me? And I had lots of excuses. I, like Moses, I, I, I had a, a, a speech impediment. You, you, you can't call me. I, you, can't, you can't call me. I didn't stutter, but I had a lisp. I can't be a speaker because I have a lisp. But all of us have areas where we feel inadequate. And if you don't, you're disqualified. Because humility it's framed from feeling inadequate. When you say I am not enough, it makes you pray harder. Yeah. It makes you seek harder. It makes you ask for more grace. Yeah. Beware of all the people who tell you they are enough. Yeah. It's a sure sign that you're dealing with a fraud. 
because the questions the world is asking are too complicated for you to answer with a degree. Yeah. The problems people are having now require divine intervention. Yes. And you have to have somebody who has heard from God, yes. not from themselves. Yes. So it doesn't matter. In my weakness, he's made strong. Yes. In, in my weakness, his strength is validated. So he chooses fragile, broken, limited people so you won't be confused where the ointment comes from. You know that the glory that we have is not of ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord that has given us the glory. And it's him coming out of us. It's not our talent coming out of it. It's not our skill coming out of it. It is him coming out, both to do and to will according to his own good pleasure. That's the facts. Yes. And what makes God all the more real is recognizing that he can work with such poor material. Yes. Yes. That, he can, that he can be so masterful as Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel with a broken brush. Yes. And I am the brush. Mm -hmm. And you are the brush. And you are the brush. And you are the brush. And he chooses broken brushes so that there will be no glory to the brush only to the artist when the master the master vintner plans to transplant you arguing will not stop it he will not let you go until he's moved you to the place that he has prepared for you and you for it. And placing you in that place, you begin to grow. And you will know you're in the place when like Joseph, your branches reach over walls. When God plants you, your branches reach over every denominational, racial, generational wall that ever stood. And I believe he wanted you to hear this at this moment in your life. Imagine being in the wilderness, miles and miles of sand, hot, scorching hot sand beneath your feet, the blazing sun above your head. Imagine walking and seeing nothing but repetitions of what you're walking on. Not just on the ground, but in the wind, in your nostrils, in your clothing, all around you. This was the wilderness that Israel walked through to get to the promised land. Sand under your feet, sand in your nostrils, in your hair, heat, in the day, freezing cold at night, the only covering they had was the presence of God and they had to stay up under it because he gave them heat in the night and shade by day. Thank you for the shade you gave me. Thank you for how you put a buffer between me and the things that I went through. And in the middle of the desert, with the 12 tribes of Israel, God decided to have a date with man. And he decided to have a date in a tabernacle. And the Hebrew word for tabernacle is ohel mohed. It means a tent of meeting. It's a rendezvous place. It's a place where divinity courts humanity.